Uh, that journey is called Urban Renewal is Scapegoated to Justify Current Conditions of Spatial Domination. Um, there'll be lots of pictures. Also, if you haven't seen our exhibition inside the panorama yet, do take some time to either join Damon and I after this talk or at some other point in your visit today. And I recommend you start at the top and work your way down. What we've done is set up a timeline um, to illustrate actually the presence of urban renewal in New York City's prep landscape today. The timeline starts in 1949 with Title I, with the passage of Title I of the Housing Act, which made money available for cities from the federal government for neighborhood clearance and reconstruction. The federal government closed that funding stream in 1974, but our timeline continues. In fact, more urban renewal plans were adopted for New York City neighborhoods after 1974 than before. Uh, so start at the top. You'll start with the uh, federally supported program. And as you work your way down, you'll see how New York City has taken the program and really made it its own, leaving many, many neighborhoods full of people who are disconnected from the political process and maybe don't look like the people who New York City planners want to see in our neighborhoods vulnerable to the kind of planning that pushes them out of the neighborhoods where they live. <sighs> and then at four o'clock, um, we'll be um, joined by the University of Orange for a program called From Redlining to Gentrification. Um, we fortunately, we have an empty seat here. Amy Laura Kahn is from Philadelphia, and she's still in Philadelphia. She's a little sick. Um, so I will be actually, after my co-presenters introduce themselves, I'll be starting us out by reading a short piece of an article that she wrote about the use of the term blight and its role in the urban renewal universe. I'm going to let my co-panelists introduce themselves quickly. Hi, I'm Marcy Reven and I'm the... Uh, I'm an historian and the vice president for history exhibits at New York Historical Society. I am Gabriella Bendinger Miani, and I am a professor of urban studies at the New School. I'm also the director of an interdisciplinary practice on place and dialogue called Buscada. Um, and for about six years, I have been running a project called the Layers Borough Project um, around the Seward Park urban renewal area and teaching with a bunch of wonderful students doing collaborative public work about Spura. So we're going to talk about that. So I'm actually just channeling Amy Laura Khan. I'm just going to give you a little bit of, a little bit of heavy language, and then we'll we'll go into the specifics. Um, so this is from an article in the Harvard Civil Rights and Civil Liberties Law Review that was published last year. We are past the time to retire blight, not simply as a metaphor, but as a policy and legal framework for rebuilding cities. Ah, sorry about that. Ask Eastwick, a low-lying community in Southwest Philadelphia, home to the largest urban renewal project in history. In the years leading up to the passage of the Federal Urban Re Redevelopment Program in Title I of the Housing Act of 1949, city planners, reformers, private developers, and governments at all levels adopted the language of blight to talk about neighborhoods. Too often, this rhetoric provided the framework and cover to treat people as movable and land as a market commodity, instead of treating both as integral living components of communities. These terms and past actions continue to shape local policy. Despite all the lessons learned from the failures of urban renewal, dangers of eminent domain, and benefits of new city planning models, we are still using the rhetoric of blight to disenfranchise communities. A designation of blight originates outside of a community and pulls power away from that community, accompanied by external definitions of values, assets, challenges, and solutions. Residents, like local governments, want solutions to the problems of disinvestment, of empty homes, and of abandoned lots. However, 
top-down neighborhood development that is not rooted in residents' needs, voices, and strengths can perpetuate health disparities and other inequalities. Thus, people most affected often must accept unwanted land uses in their areas while failing to reap the benefits of development. In contrast, promoting participatory decision-making and ensuring communities' power over neighborhood futures has the potential to promote healthy, sustainable, and verdant communities. And I'm going to turn it over to my co-presenters to give you a little bit of hope. <laughs> Pass me the uh, clicker. <laughs> okay, so again, my name is Marcy Reven, and my talk today is going to focus mainly on a neighborhood-based organization known as the Cooper Square Committee that began its work during the heyday of urban renewal in New York, which is the uh, 1950s through the mid-1970s. So committee members fought to protect their neighborhood from destruction while also trying to improve lives. So it was a big change in 30 years. Now I don't mean to suggest that this turn towards citizen participation in planning leveled the playing field, but rather that important changes did come about as a result of concerted effort on the part of activists of many sorts. Uh, so this is a map of urban renewal areas uh, created by the Slum Clearance Committee in the 1950s. So the Cooper Square Committee, the group that I'm going to be focusing on, first organized in 1959 when its members learned that New York Slum Clearance Committee, led by Robert Moses, planned to demolish yet another part of the Lower East Side to build middle-income co-ops. Committee members included an urban planner, tenant activists, social workers, artists, and then eventually many others. This new project planned to bulldoze the blocks between East 9th Street and Delancey in the Lower East Side and 2nd and 3rd Avenues. The development would replace the stores, tenements, and a settlement house with high rises surrounded by landscaping and filled with middle-income co-ops. So a kind of development that you have seen uh, around the city. And that the black area was the uh, imagined urban renewal area. The Square Committee jumped into action extremely quickly once they knew about the plan, because they also knew that this project was going to displace the people who already lived there. Most locals could not possibly afford the new housing. Residents were almost entirely low-income renters and lodging house tenants on the Bowery, largely white ethnic, but also Puerto Rican and African American. And in 1959 alone, when this is all happening, urban renewal projects throughout the city would displace about 15,000 people just that one year. A housing shortage coupled with housing discrimination made finding a new place extremely difficult for those that were displaced. So committee members moved aggressively to stop the bulldozing, but they also got lucky. In 1960, prompted by political pressures and financial scandals, Mayor Wagner shut down the Slum Clearance Committee and canceled urban renewal in Cooper Square. So now this would have been the moment for the activists to claim success and close up shop. But instead, they decided to create their own alternate plan for renewal, and they put themselves forward as the city's partner. It was one of the first times that anything like that had happened. They agreed that the area needed to be improved. The housing was terrible but they imagined that it could and should be done to benefit and not harm local residents. So after intense work, the Cooper Square Committee published its alternate plan in 1961. They then spent years trying to get the city to work with them to implement the plan. So the committee's main idea, which at that time was little credited, was that even in places that were called slums or blighted, the residents should not have to sacrifice themselves for the supposed good of the city or for others. So you're looking at a model of the alternate plan that the Cooper Square Committee put on view in its office. It was a professionally done plan and got a lot of outside attention for being one of the first to be developed by a neighborhood-based group. So the alternate plan envisioned a mix of housing types for existing and new residents of different ages, economic levels, and lifestyles. 
It included the first artist housing in the city and also furnished rooms, which was a type of lodging that had been banned by regulation by the city, but actually offered really important kinds of living arrangements for certain groups of people. So here's Frances Golden, one of the committee founders. She's at the Department of City Planning, trying to pressure the city into partnering with the uh, committee to implement the alternate plan. The activists insisted that not only should neighborhood residents be among those who receive the benefits of renewal, but they should also participate in its planning. These ideas directly challenged the conventional wisdom of planning as it was then practiced. So the theory went that neighborhood groups always looked out for their own self-interest, and they were likely to sacrifice the common interests. Planners and city officials, on the other hand, supposedly balanced the needs of the public arriving at solutions that advanced the common interest and fairly distributed sacrifice. So the Cooper Square Committee was one of the first to challenge this idea. They questioned the neutrality of planning, pointing to the financial and political interests that bound planners to their employers in government and real estate. So the committee didn't say that neighborhood groups were always right, but they dismissed the idea that neighborhood affiliation rendered them incapable of acting as citizens and participating responsibly. So many planners and architects adopted this new vision of planning during the 1960s and 70s under the banner of something they called advocacy planning. So it, it, this ad advocacy planning signaled growing acceptance of the idea that planning wasn't just technical, but also political. That residents of neighborhoods should be represented by planners, and that planners should be forthright, forthright about who they advocated for, who they worked for. So advocacy planners, including Walter Thabit, who worked with the Cooper Square Committee, played an important part in helping ordinary citizens take the initiative for planning in their areas. Uh, the Pratt Center for Community Development is founded in 1963 as one long-standing result of this advocacy planning movement. So in this photo from the 1980s, Cooper Square committee members are celebrating the groundbreaking of new low-income rentals on Bowery and Stanton Street. In the end, the committee was able to achieve a number of their goals, but their struggles were legion and they lasted really into the early 2000s. A couple of weeks ago, there was a film here which told much of their story it's called It Took 50 Years, Francis Gould and, and the Struggle for Cooper Square. So it's uh, one way to learn, watching that film is one way to learn more about this full story. So today, among the many things that the committee and its mutual housing association can take credit for, are new low-income housing units, supportive housing for the formerly homeless, moderate rent commercial space, and 21 renovated former tenement buildings whose apartments rent for far below market rate. They also created a land trust to keep the apartments permanently affordable. Their buildings grouped around East 4th Street and the East Village have kept some amount of racial and economic diversity in what's now a pretty gentrified surroundings. So looking back at their long struggle, it's worth noting a few of the strategies and tools that helped the committee achieve some of its goals. Much of the group's technical expertise owed to the planner Walter Thabit's participation but Thabit didn't carry the burden alone. So many committee members developed significant expertise themselves in housing and land use regulations. And they learned the jargon and methodologies of urban planners. So often, actually, city officials would turn to them for information, because they were the best, they were the experts in their area. The members were also incredibly tenacious. Um, they kept up pressure through all kinds of setbacks. This is a sleep-in at Gracie Mansion in the snow with one committee member of their showing. Uh, and here, Francis Gould, oops, they worked constantly to get news coverage. What we missed was a shot of uh, Francis Golden about to be arrested at the city council, so they were always putting their, uh, their freedom on the line. 
And they also carefully nurtured membership and leadership uh, and actually operated with a fair degree of democracy throughout the many years that they were working. So this didn't mean that every single person participated to the fullest, but some took part by coming to mass meetings, others by serving on committees, others by marching, talking to the press, getting arrested, and so on. People did what they could. What was important to group cohesion over time is that some people took it upon themselves to educate the others, to become the holders of the wisdom and knowledge about the project, and then to pass it on. The Cooper Square Committee also maintained its own historical record. So members wrote up chronologies of their efforts and in letter after letter to public officials detailed what had been promised, when, by whom, usually not delivered. But marshalling this evidence kept the campaign's history and their first principles in plain view for the members and the larger public. The committee, and especially Walter Thabit, who's here, pictured here, also thought that it was important to use every available forum. So one important forum that I'd like to mention that developed from the late 1940s to the 1970s was the community board. Community districts and their governing boards were first proposed in the late 1940s by civic groups like the Citizens Union. The idea was that the size of the city and the distance between government and people worked against efficient governance and democracy. So the war against fascism in Europe was fresh, was fresh on people's minds, and so an interest in protecting democracy spurred these activists on. New York's many civic groups, architects, planners, and others organized ambitiously for community boards. They got them instituted in Manhattan in the 1950s, and then in 1963, community boards were introduced into the city charter. In 1969, a second law expanded their powers and gave the boards for the first time a recognized role in landscape planning. With further organizing and the involvement of charter commissions, in 1975, community boards were made part of a new formalized system of land use planning that we know as EULER, the Uniform Land Use Review Procedure. Again, this isn't to suggest that EULER created a level playing field. Much of the debate during the creation of community boards had to do with how much power and what kinds of resources to invest in the boards. And in the end, advocates for weaker boards won out. But for groups like the Cooper Square Committee, who saw themselves as citizens of the city and the polity at large, the boards provided another forum for expressing their policy judgments as citizens and for learning about plans while there was still a chance of affecting the outcome, unlike what had happened in Cooper Square in the late 1950s. So thanks. as you mentioned, uh, dates back to 1975 when the city was shrinking. Uh, is there anything you would change in community board structure today um, to maybe make it easier for them to propose alternative plans like this one as opposed to just saying no, um, which is what they do a lot of the time to any uh, neighborhood changes? Well, there have been if I'm not mistaken, I think the uh, provision for communities to create their own plans, the 197A plans and others, uh, came into being in 1975. Is that correct? There, there have been other changes uh, since then. Whether those some, some small administrative changes, I, d I don't think there have been changes fundamentally in the process of, of how the 
community boards interact within this larger structure, but uh, I may not be the best one to speak on that. Can you imagine trying to coordinate an entire district and 50 volunteers with a staff of two? That's what we're talking about. 197A plans are advisory plans that communities, with the involvement or of a community board or not, can create. They are advisory only. One of the reasons that we've been focusing on the history of urban renewal is because we realize that there's a place for leverage there, especially the neighborhoods where plans have already been adopted but are still active and open to revision. Getting an official urban renewal plan actually revised to meet community needs, which is what the Cooper Square Committee ultimately did in 1970, is a route to seeing actual changes in your neighborhood, which are the ones you want to see. Melro the Melrose Commons plan was a response to a Robert Moses authored plan that was going to wipe out the South Bronx community um, that was rewritten by the South Bronx community, it, it, an entirely new plan that fit the same boundaries that were defined by the Planning Commission, took the place of the original plan. That's a place that communities really, really have leverage. Right now we're working with folks in Rockaway on the Arburn Urban Renewal Plan area, there are still 81 acres of that urban renewal plan area that are vacant. Those used to be people's homes. Those homes were cleared a long time ago. Federal money paid the companies that owned the bulldozers and the dumpsters that came and did that. It happened two generations ago. It's hard to get those people organized because they are gone but the people who are living close by will be affected by what happens on those 81 acres. So uh, the city of New York has put that out for private development through a RFP process. It's too late to rewrite the plan because that process has already happened. So with that community, we're looking for leverage by having a relationship with the development team and actually putting a lot of the community's aspirations straight into the developer's plan and looking for an enforceable contract with the developer that would make those aspirations into reality. So it's a matter of assessments. The community planning boards are a fantastic mechanism for having a sounding board and for knowing who in, the, in a particular district really cares, but they don't necessarily have the leverage to make change alone. That answer your question. Somebody like Walter Thabit in the Cooper Square Committee, for all the reasons that Paul is just describing, thought that it was critical to not only have access to a forum like the community board, but also to have a very active committee that was always pressing. So it was kind of an inside-outside maneuver that they thought was critical. Another burning question before we, we shift gears. You guys are all set. It all makes perfect sense. <laughs> totally know what to do next. Fair enough. Do you want this one? Okay. So, all of those pieces of history. Um, bring us right into Spura and all of the kinds of questions and the uh, questions about the setup of the community boards, the context of the formation of the Cooper Square Committee and um, the great effectiveness that they were able to have really brings us to the context for thinking about the Seward Park Urban Renewal Area. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this project and then we're going to kind of try and tell a history a little bit together so you'll see what I mean. Um, we're talking about the area, you've probably all seen it, you probably all know where it is, um, even if you didn't know what it was. Um, so it's south of Delancey on the approach to the Williamsburg Bridge. There's a whole bunch of weird Delancey, down to Grand Street, east of Essex, over to Pitt. Uh, it's a, quite a large area, it's about 14 square blocks. So this is from uh, early promotional materials about the uh, the planning of uh, Seward Park and the idea that it should be 
um, torn down to make way for new housing. Uh, you can see over here to the south, that's the south side of Grand Street, and those are the uh, middle income uh, limited equity co-ops that were built uh, in the mid 50s or by 58, also uh, was the first section of the urban renewal plan. Those were limited equity co-ops for uh, labor union, uh, where most people were from the ILGWU, from um, people who worked in the garment industries. So north of this is the sort of second phase of Spura, and that's what you're looking at here, is the highlighted piece is 14 square blocks of very dense tenements. So this is what we're talking about, and this is what was torn down, um, that we're kind of grappling with the, that history today. Uh, by 1970, you can see the, the map. There's no more buildings left in that area, very, very few. Um, so over that period of time, um, there was a lot of demolition that happened. By 67 is when the um, Seward Park plan really came into effect um, and changes really started to happen. People were moved out. Many, many people were displaced. Um, there were about... Uh, a, uh, 18, 1,800 families, um, mostly people of color, mostly low income, who were displaced from that 14 square block radius. Um, pretty significant kind of displacement. All of those people were promised, um, though how they were promised and with what documentation is unclear, um, that they would have the right to return to the new buildings that were built. So this is what it looks like now though not for much longer. Uh, this is Grand Street looking north. Um, you may recognize some of these buildings. This building over here um, is about to be demolished. This is 400 Grand Street. Um, and we're looking north. You can see the blue building in the distance. That's the blue building on Delancey Street. Um, so you can kind of understand the radical change that happened in this area, both in terms of the demolition and then also in terms of the vacancy that has been there and the kind of feeling of um, both displacement and kind of the piecemeal way in which this part of the city has kind of had to take on a life in the last 40 years. So I want to talk with you guys a little bit about this project called Laird Spura, partially because I want to sort of broaden our conversation today. Um, it's really important to think about the histories of Cooper Square and Spura and all of these particular urban renewal sites, but I think you know, to our point of thinking about, well, how do we make change and how do we learn from these histories to think about what are the other possibilities in places where plans are not yet set, where things are not yet clear, right? So how do we kind of think, learn from these histories to think about how do we broaden possibilities for conversation? How do we broaden ways to get other voices into planning um, in the city? And from my perspective, um, so I, as I said, I'm a, um, I teach at the New School, I'm a professor of urban studies, I'm also an artist, and I'm really interested in the ways in which art, public history, public practice, scholarship, all of those things, the idea of creative work can actually help us understand these really complicated, really naughty problems. Um, how can we, how can that, those kinds of ways of looking at things help us take them apart, make them more personal, make them more human, um, and also make potentially more spaces for to have the conversation about this, um, about the crises that are going on in American cities, right? So not just New York City, but this seems to happen in language that actually makes sense to people rather than in acronyms, right? So, um, so this is a project that I started about six years ago uh, in collaboration with Marthy <laughs> um, and in collaboration with uh, Damaris Reyes from Goals and Joel Feingold, who are, will be here very soon. They are rushing on their way here um, to think about the ways in which kind of different kinds of practices could open up conversation about a very, very contested site at the Seward Park Urban Renewal Area. And so this project um, that we're going to kind of simulate here is a series of guided tour cards that are kind of a crib sheet for trying to understand a super, super complicated place. And I want you guys to imagine that we were standing 
over here. It's probably really cold and windy and really yucky. <laughs> probably really noisy because there's a lot of traffic. Maybe it'd be even worse if we're standing up on the corner of Broom Street. There's a lot of traffic heading towards the Williamsburg Bridge. Um, it's really, really windy. Um, and I want you to imagine that we are trying to kind of take a walk and look at this place and trying to understand it for ourselves. Um, so I've asked a few people in the audience to, to, to be our um, tour guides on this walk. Um, so those of you who have your little cards, I'm going to ask you to, to read to us, kind of to give us a little insight into some of the voices and some of the histories of the Seward Park River Renewal Area. Uh, yes, <laughs> Claudia's over. Claudia's over there. Oh. So she's she's going to be number one. Uh, um, they're in order. Yeah, they're in order. <laughs> um, so imagine you're looking over Claudia's shoulder, and imagine you're you're sort of feeling a spur around you. So design for renewal. This comes from uh, a promotional brochure for the sewer park renewal area from 1955. A challenging concept in design for redevelopment in urban renewal is proposed in the Seward Park Extension Urban Renewal Project. The chief objective of this concept is to renew the area physically while maintaining its social, economic, and visual continuity with the surrounding community, while still serving a broad range of low and middle income families. So this is a promotional brochure that was sent out to people about this before this actually happened. Right, and it proposed those lofty ideals. I would say almost none of those actually came to fruition. Actually, can I borrow the microphone? Yes. So this was, this was shortly after Stuyvesant Village was built, which was a pre-urban renewal project, but it was one of the projects that actually created the blueprint for the urban renewal program. And one of the big criticisms about Stuyvesant Village is that it has a wall over it. Right? It is disconnected from the local community. And this seems like a direct response, right? It's going to be just as good, but we're not building that wall. Right. It's got number two. In 55, you should think about kind of the things that were happening at <laughs> Cooper Square. So the buildings that were already being built on the south side of Grand Street, that was already happening at the, the original part of um, Spurrow, that was already moving ahead. Um, all of these kinds of questions were already kind of in motion at Cooper Square. Um, you know, the, the committee had not yet been founded, but this is kind of the moment in which it's still very popular to propose urban renewal and large scale plans, but within, I would say, another five years, things radically changed about the way that people felt about publicly about urban renewal. So here's another grand plan. Okay, this is a quote from William Gottlieb from the Automobile Club of New York. Every delay gives added hope to those who indulge themselves in partisan politics and who make municipal progress a dirty word. The next quote is Assemblyman Louis de Salvio. Except for one old man, I've been unable to find anyone of technical competence who is for this so-called expressway. But I think it is time for the stubborn old man to realize that too many of his dreams turn out to be nightmares for this city. And then the note is Lomax would have cut through Spura. Uh, so who's the old man? Does anybody have a suggestion there? Robert Moses. He's the old man, yes he is. Okay, so the Lower Manhattan Expressway, very famous from the fight between um, uh, Robert Moses and Jane Jacobs, uh, would have cut through a portion of Spur. So it starts to complicate the story of this plan of taking land and revising it, right? All of a sudden it starts to look less, a little bit less appealing for developers who might want to, to become the sponsor for that land, right? So all of a sudden a big chunk of it is going to get cut through by this big expressway, which all of a sudden has really not a lot of uh, people very excited about it. Number three. Okay. Being displaced. People were really upset. Some of the buildings were really sturdy, strong. Equal buildings that were kept are still standing. So it wasn't like they needed to be, to be demolished. Everybody that lived in the area was told that they could move back. That was part of the deal. Former Spura residents. 
So it's a part of uh, an oral history about experiences of living at Spura. Um, so as you can see, so the plan for Spura did go ahead, um, but one of the complexities that would really change what actually happened there was that it had originally had a sponsor. So in the same way that the Cooper Square Committee proposed an alternate plan and decided to put themselves forward as a sponsor, all urban renewal plants need to have a sponsor to be the developer, right? The city is not the developer. Um, and so the sponsor for Spura pulled out for many, many reasons. But by the mid-60s, this was very unappealing, um, starting to look very unappealing. People like Cooper Square were starting to seriously organize. Um, the, the Lomax was coming, was potentially going to be built. All of these complexities meant that, that it was maybe something that people didn't want to get involved in. Um, so it had had a sponsor who were the, the um, developers who had built the buildings on the south side of Grand Street, but they pulled out. So even though this, this urban renewal plan didn't have a sponsor, the buildings were slated for demolition anyway. Um, and so people started getting moved out. And, Buildings were consolidated. Who's the next person? There's number four. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is again being displaced. I remember that it started slowly on Suffolk Street. It started taking tenants from one building, putting them in another building, closing that building over and over, and then it happened to us. One week, my parents were told, you get $150 for re relocation, you gotta go. And that was it. Three weeks, you gotta go. And after we went, the building stayed empty for years before they finally took it down. Uh, this is two and a half columns of Spur displacees in the New York Times. So, buildings were torn down. We, Spur gets, this is a very consolidated history of a really, really messy process, but there were, there was one sponsor that decided to take two plots of land, that was the New York City Housing Authority, um, and they built these two buildings. Um, when they built them, something else happened. <laughs> Can we have, I think, it's number five. Oh, yeah. Um, so this is from the Joint Planning Council records. The charge, the Housing Authority had decided that a majority of the apartments should be rented to white families. They could only accomplish this by renting some apartments to non-former site tenants. The settlement, allocating apartments in the two public housing buildings to families on a basis of 60% Hispanic and other minority and 40% white. 161 former site tenants would get priority. The remaining 197 apartments would be parceled out um, on the ethnic quota. So there's some really important pieces there, right? So that these buildings that were built, when they were actually filled, they did not honor at all the the, the promise to re to give priority to former site tenants. Um, when they were forced to, because they were this class action lawsuit was brought by neighborhood activists kind of really trying to, to change the way that things were happening at Spura. Um, and through this class action law through by sit-ins at the developer's offices, um, uh, by or in the NYCHA offices, um, by direct action, they radically changed what happened in those buildings. But you can see there was still, uh, we're, we're still living in the um, early 70s. Uh, there, this, instead of, opening up these buildings, there were still all kinds of conversation about neighborhood tipping points and kind of racist ideas about what would happen with the ways that you fill buildings. So the idea of a racial quota was something that was perfectly acceptable as part of this suit. That's part of this history and that's part of what, what brings us to today. Who's next? Yeah. Community. This was said by a former Spurra resident. It means poor people struggling to raise their family and looking after each other and looking after each other's kids, kind of taking care of each other when there is need. Unfortunately, I don't see that anymore. And our next voice is right up here. So that, that brings us up to kind of 
many, many, many things happened between then and now, and this is a voice from now. I think that all of it should be affordable housing because it was the poor people that were displaced. But as a realist, if that's the concessions that have to be made to get some affordable housing built, then I'll gladly make those concessions. I would have no problem with mixed income, not luxury. We have enough luxury housing on the Lower East Side. And that's from the uh, Lower East Side. Okay. So, that's almost 40 years after the demolition of these buildings happened. Um, there are multiple uh, plans proposed, all of them uh, stymied over questions about affordable housing, where either portions of the community thought there was too little affordable housing or too much. Um, and they were quite violent disagreements. Uh, there was also uh, a lot of conversation about uh, whether it should be no housing at all and only be retail. Um, we're talking about a neighborhood that changed radically from the late 60s through the 70s, through the 1980s, into the 90s, right? We're talking about kind of all of these many, many powers that have changed American cities in the last 45 years, kind of their impact was felt pretty drastically on the Lower East Side, right? So we have um, huge disinvestment, abandonment, we have the um, crack epidemics and, and, and kind of, um, we have art movements that kind of come through the Lower East Side, we have massive gentrification that happened, and then you have this kind of big uh, efforts of development to happen, right? And so one of the things that I think is really important about that quote is that we have enough luxury housing here on the Lower East Side. Um, there are other quotes that say we have enough public housing here on the Lower East Side, right? So the, that fight is very real and very violent um, and also has a lot of money behind it. So some of you may have heard about Sheldon Silver. I don't know. <laughs> um, and his friend Rob Vogel. Uh, all of those histories are part of what has, has happened at Spura, right? So there's a great deal of money involved in this. So on one hand, there are kind of uh, interpersonal and intercultural and, and, and interclass kind of struggles that are part of Spura. Um, and on the other hand, there is just a huge amount of money that's been interested in keeping Spura vacant uh, or filled with parking lots. So, uh, and in kind of continuing the enmity that's, that's been a part of this neighborhood. Um, Oh, here's, a, here's another quote, and I'm going to read it, just to save you all the pain. Uh, us, we're in a gentrifying world here, and we don't want low-income housing. We've got more than our share. I think even mixed housing, which is what I favor, is going to be a hard sell. But I think it can be done if it's done the right way. It can't be done by shoving it down our throats. We'll just do it again. We've done the same thing again. We've done it before. And that's talking about how many plans uh, were overturned. Um, particularly um, in 2003, there was a, a very, very kind of violent uh, overturning of a plan because of the amount of affordable housing that it actually promised. Um, and our last reader. While the most popular seems to be creating housing for working class and moderate income households, many people favor mixed income housing on the site. In addition to residential development, space for community activities and business is also desired. People want to see development generate jobs for local residents. So that's a quote from the Spur of Matters report, which is kind of what I wanted to, to bring us up to, um, which was a report and a process that Marcy was a part of, um, and that Goals was a part of, um, and that was part of the way that I came into this was around thinking about how can we um, change the conversation and, and make these kinds of voices more audible within the context of thinking about Spura. So how can uh, Spura and community participation go from being uh, reactionary to kind of reacting against a plan rather than, or rather than to be about starting the conversation and letting this conversation actually, and controlling the conversation from an in a ground up kind of way. Um, so this report was authored by the Pratt Center um, and that uh, was part of a kind of community research through community visioning sessions, through public conversations, sort of uh, spurred by 
Marcy's really amazing public history talks about the history of the Spura um, through a whole range of strategies to try and get people talking about Spura before um, a, a new plan was proposed. So this is in starting in 2008, um, and this was the result of it. This was the, the, the report that was published. Um, so I wanted to kind of give you guys a, a little snippet of the history and a little feeling of all of the things that have been going on, all the different pieces and the strands of Spura, which um, there are many, many more, but to kind of bring us up to the process that uh, happened through the community board um, over the past several years um, and kind of where we are now. Um, and with that, I'd actually really like to introduce Joel Feingold who came in and he's sitting at the back and I'd love to bring him up here. Um, uh, Joel is a housing activist and um, for a long time worked with goals uh, around Stuart Park Urban Renewal Area. Join us. Um, And I'm wondering if I can put you on the spot and, and ask you to um, kind of introduce some of the thinking about the strategies for, for organizing at Spur and, and what you did. Here, can you do Room houses. Um, so we were really deeply rooted in the working class of the Lower East Side. Um, and so many people knew former site tenants, um, either as friends, family. Um, and so, my role um, was to try to get as many former site tenants and working class Lower East Side tenants and public housing residents to fight during the community board process over um, the redevelopment guidelines. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I was sort of around towards the end of the, this, um, the research process. Uh, and from there, we tried to pivot into a, a more traditional organizing strategy of trying to um, mobilize and uh, bring uh, the power of working class Lower East Side residents into this, into this planning process to try to counteract the very powerful private interests and city interests that wanted up, you know, upscale development on the site, didn't necessarily want to prioritize the right to return for former site tenants. Um, so um, that was the sort of juncture at which I started organizing on this project. So I think maybe we should uh, explain a little bit of what happened and Marcy, do you want to jump in a little bit in terms of thinking about square matters or not? <laughs> um, part of what came out of this um, and I'll introduce a little bit of the, the further work that I've been doing with my students was in this sort of trying to get these conversations to be coming kind of from a ground up level. Um, and so one of the things, so this report was released um, and shortly after that, uh, the city decided that they would actually support a community board led process to uh, come up with um, a series of, of kind of requirements and, and like a proposal basically. Um, not binding, but a, a series of requirements. And, and that uh, doing that was very, very unusual, right? And I think this sort of speaks to some of these questions about, um, you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a plan, but it, it really was a very unusual process. Rather than kind of the city putting out an RFP, letting developers go to town on it, presenting it back to the community board and letting that be the moment where community members actually get to respond. Uh, this was actually saying, well, how can the, the community be a part of drafting that RFP that would go out to developers? Um, there are many things that are imperfect about that process, but it was very unusual. Uh, it was the first time that there was more kind of conversation that was happening at the community level than there ever had been kind of rather than in, in response to um, a developer's plans. Um, so, I think maybe I will uh, just tell you guys a little bit about um, one of the things that, that, that I did with my students and, and to can then come back to, I think, to Joel and to talk about the ways in which you sort of use these different spaces for conversations. Um, so, as I was saying, uh, so these are some of the community visioning sessions that were held as part of the um, Spur of Matters project. Some of these are my students taking part. Um, and you know, this, these were mapping projects. These were uh, conversations about um, 
to what could actually happen on the site. And one of the big conversations, and I remember having these conversations very clearly um, with Joel and with Damaris and with Marcy about kind of well, what what kind of rules in these kinds of uh, community visioning sessions would be acceptable. And some of those were what are the rules that were being set sort of set forth by the city in terms of um, that planning at Spura had to be self-funding, was that an acceptable rule? And I think that idea of the rules and the idea of the kind of spaces to discuss those rules um, is a big part of the, the interesting kind of thinking about this model and thinking about how does it apply to other places. Um, so the city said, well, there is to be no external funding, funding for Spura, which means that if you want to have affordable housing, you have to have some serious luxury housing, or if you want to have a park, you better have something else that's going to pay for it. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, you know, this poor site tenants, 1,852 displaced majority uh, people of color, majority, you know, all working class or poor people, their demands, their traditional demands on the site have been for low income, integrated low income housing. Um, the model of capitalism under which we now live has shifted since the 60s and 70s such that uh, the city no longer subsidizes low-income housing directly, or that's the claim, right? So when the community board, for example, did their own version of these visioning exercises to sort of guide in place um, on the developer as they begin to craft, you know, uh, the leases for all these retail spaces. I just want to add one other thing in terms of, I mean, there are many things in terms of uh, keeping developers accountable, but one of the other big projects of uh, Spark, which is the kind of coalition that Damaris talked about before, um, is to gather names of former site tenants. So while this kind of right to return was granted in the RFP, um, if you don't have the names of people, there's really no way to hold developers accountable. So that work of kind of just finding those people's names and contact information and getting that out there so that there's no way to say, oh, we didn't know, uh, is another really important piece of work in this kind of keeping people accountable. I mean, I think another thing too, we got the developer to put on their website a link so that you can go on and you can register and check that you were a former site tenant. But I think the challenge there is going to be the proof that people have to provide. And I, you know, I, I saw a, a post the other day on Facebook from someone because I put up, like, you know, I put a little bit about the history of Spur, and I was like, if you're a former site tenant, and you know, you have to bring documents. And somebody said, oh, okay, great. You know, now I'm going to have to go find my dead mother and ask her to give me rent receipts and all these things. And so that was like a real moment. It was a little morbid, but it was a real moment that. They may not be able to obtain some of these documents. They're going to have to get creative. Um, but we're pushing them to sort of, you know, open up what they see as eligible to include other things that may be, may be, may be able to prove that people live there. So that's a really great place, actually, I think, to pause our discussion. Our, we have this incredible think tank here. Um, if you haven't been in the panorama yet, one of the walls that we have occupied in the panorama asks the question, what can we do? Right? In the face of top-down neighborhood planning that is not predisposed to include people from neighborhoods, what is it that we as the residents can do? And in the last two hours, I feel like we've gotten some fantastic recipes. I hope everybody is walking away with at least one action idea that you can take as inspiration from goals and the folks at Spura and apply to your own neighborhood as we all stay vigilant in New York to a continuing legacy of this kind of planning. Um, as you see from the map, this is neither history nor is it just one site. Spura is one site out of over 150, and over 60 of those are still active. Um, so thank you guys so much. Thank you, Marcy and Damaris, Gabriel and Joel. Thank you are all here for perfect times to lead us through. And I'm going to invite everybody to follow me down the stairs and into the panorama. Uh, I'm going to read the very inviting title of Damon's talk to us in the next hour 
urban renewal is scapegoated to justify current conditions of spatial domination. I think it'll be funny. Um, but we're going to start down at the bottom. There are two entrances to the panorama. We're going to use the main entrance through the lobby. So it's down the glass stairs. And if you got, if you got final questions for the panelists, if you guys don't mind hanging out for a few minutes and then joining us. Possible. Um, and so it was then that we stumbled upon, well, why don't we work on Squirrel? Uh, you know, we have been in Spark, and several years before that, I had been at a community board meeting where people from the southern part of the neighborhood were protesting because they didn't want to see any affordable housing built in their neighborhood. And I was in that meeting, and I was a recipient of that protest. And I want you to think about what it might feel like to be in your own community, to be an organizer, someone who has protested for the greater part of their career, right, their life, and you are now the recipient of that. You are the recipient of people yelling at you in your own hood, people that you went to school with, that you know maybe went to the same they go to the same supermarket. It was a surreal experience and it changed my life. And I knew that Spur was going to be an issue that I wanted to work on. And it kind of makes me emotional sometimes because I remember that day clearly. And to be able to turn that anger around and use it in this way was really powerful. But that was sort of the impetus for us to work on it in that sort of way. And the idea of using history was, I think, why our relationship worked so well. And when Gabrielle came along, we met a bunch of times before we sort of really made our partnership solid. Because I had to understand what that role was going to be. Why do you want to work with us? Tell us how you, you know what your method is. I mean, Gabrielle, she was great. You know, it's not about her. I was like, you know, it's your institution, you know. We have a little bit of a different attitude now, and I think now we use, you know, what we learned from that process, which I think is also extremely valuable, is that we have, you know, since had many different relationships with different classes at all the different academic institutions, and it has really proven to be very fruitful, this sort of organizer-student partnership that we have found, so. I just want to show a few images, and I think we should take leave some time for some questions. But oh, no question right now. Yeah, um, I just want to. This is a an image from a project. So sort of telling histories. Um, this is an image from a student project, uh, an oral history project with um, Ed Rudick, and this is his family who was displaced from Sparrow. So really, kind of thinking about how do you get these other voices and these kind of more human stories into it. So that's part of what the the student projects really tried to do. Um, we reached out to a lot of different audiences. Um, this was a third exhibition that was at the Abrams Art Center, actually one of the few buildings that was actually built through the renewal, the kind of original in the early 70s, so it's kind of an interesting um, reintroduction of that history into that site. Um, another oral history project, and, and a project that was called Framings for a, um, that really tried to look at all the different ways that people had tried to sort of put um, histories and stories onto Spura, both in terms of cultural histories that were there that maybe people didn't know, um, or the kind of multiple plans, the ways in which kind of imagined futures had kind of been imposed upon Spura, um, none of which had actually been built. Um, so that's people kind of looking at a, a panorama of the existing site with kind of a, a sketch of a plan that had been proposed um, a long time ago. Um, we also tried to work kind of both um, with other audiences. So this is a residency we, we had as part of Creative Times Living as Form exhibition, which was also on the Spurra site. Um, in the, one of the old, the, the disused Essex Street Market buildings, um, we really wanted to talk about the fact that this history was there um, to an audience of people who largely had no idea about it, right? So kind of to echo Damaris's point, um, there, in all of these sort of situations, it was trying to talk to different audiences who might not understand this whole history and how complex it was and what was actually happening um, at Spurra. And in this case, was you know largely talking to an arts audience, potentially from the Lower East Side, but probably had no connection at all to Spurra. Um, kind of grappling with questions about gentrification, relationships of art to gentrification, all how did that all add up to kind of the questions about what should get built at Spurra today. So thinking about these different venues for, for asking this. Um, and this was the last exhibition um, at the new school. So thinking about how did, what happened when you brought this stuff outside of um, the neighborhood. Um, and this was really when uh, 
the um, kind of things were sort of being talked about much more publicly, um, kind of not just at the community level. So thinking about the role that an exhibition could play in terms of um, kind of bringing this work outside of the neighborhood itself. Um, that was a mapping project. Um, this is a lovely project by Claudi, who's over there. <laughs> um, that really grappled with trying to think about, well, what were the spaces of Spura and to, to value what was actually there rather than talking about it only as um, kind of a, a, a tabula rasa for building on or kind of as, as a disaster, but to kind of grapple with what it actually felt like to be there um, and the restrictions of the space that were there. Um, these were lovely viewing boxes. You could look inside them and feel how restricted and uncomfortable the space has been made. Um, these are some of the renderings that just got released. Um, the last two weeks. Now it's called Essex Crossing, right? So we're not talking about Spur. All those problems of Spur up, totally gone. <laughs> right? You just rename it, it's gonna be great. Um, these are the renderings, these are the, that's the existing building, this is one of the renderings for, for one of the new buildings. Um, and I just want to show you kind of the two projects from this past semester's class, kind of trying to grapple with, you know, how does this kind of approach deal with um, a very weird and in-between time. So this is one of the students' projects called What Happens in Between um, that publicly put posters up around the neighborhood to basically ask that question. Um, so kind of still working in this idea of both kind of informing people that things actually are in fact happening, um, even though it seems like people should know, yet they don't always. Um, but also the idea that when there are plans and things look that finished, um, there may still be room for change and activism. Um, and another project, uh, Bedrill is one of the participants of this project, um, kind of trying to imagine these different possible futures for this site. So even at this moment where, you know, all this conversation about the ground being broken very soon, but the conversations about possible futures or ways to change things still need to be happening. Um, and I think that's one of the things that we want to kind of open it up a little bit further for, well, how do you kind of keep that conversation happening? How do you kind of keep pressure even when a plan is in place, even when things actually are moving forward? Um, maybe I'll leave it there. This constantly inspires me. Um, I think it's one of the most amazing markers on the Seward's Park uh, Spur site. Um, Attorney Street doesn't exist at Spura. It's one of the, the um, streets that was raised as part of the plan. Um, this building was scheduled for demolition and was taken back by really incredible housing activists, um, one of whom is Tito Delgado, um, who, who basically broke the locks and moved back into this building and turned it into a, a really incredible limited equity co-op that's still very successful. Um, we don't have to accept this reality. Um, but it also took a lawsuit, right? <laughs> um, and, uh, and I want to highlight that because for me, I think what's important is understanding that there are multiple tools. And I think being able to use all of that, you know, our people power, our legal power, right? The power of advocacy and bringing all of those things together sometimes can create a winning combination for making the city do what you want. And at Spura, you know, what the demands are now is, you know, there really aren't any demands at this point. Now the, we're at the stage where we are watching the developers and the city and hope and really, you know, trying to hold them accountable for the commitments they made when they responded, you know, to be the developers, when they responded to the RFP. So. And some of those things are coming to fruition, and some of those things are just plain weird, right? So we asked for a bunch of things. We asked for housing, we asked for community space. Uh, we wanted to, we didn't even really want the Essex Street Market to be touched, but since that was something that was almost impossible to stop, um, you know, we asked that there'd be more spaces, and we asked for a bunch of stuff. So now, here's what Essex Crossing has. They're building 10% affordable senior housing. So it's low income senior housing, 20% low income housing, 10% moderate income housing. And let me just make a point about the moderate income housing. 
this is the group of people, right, that don't qualify for anything but also can't really pay the, the rent in New York City. And a lot of the people who are actually being uprooted from the neighborhood. These are like the children of people who've lived there. They grew up there. Now they get married, they have a couple of kids, and they gotta move somewhere else because they can't find an apartment in the neighborhood. So the hope was to, you know, really try to keep some space, right, for like our folks. This is not just about, you know, um, fighting for just low income people. This is about fighting for people from a neighborhood, right? Um, then we asked for community space, so you got you know, 25,000 square feet of community space for one of the organizations. There's gonna be a movie theater there. It's Regal Cinema, Perfer I prefer AMC, but we're not gonna go there. Um, the Andy Warhol Museum is coming. I mean, I, I couldn't make any sense of that. I know we're in a museum, forgive me, Queens Museum, but that was just weird to us. We, we couldn't quite figure that one out. Um, and then there's going to be a bowling alley at, at the site as well. And then there's going to be a, a bunch of retail space. And the space is going to be, the basic spaces will be small so they can serve as incubator retail spaces to encourage small businesses. Because see Delancey Street, when you walk on it, it says bargain district on the signs. But there's nothing happening there anymore. There's no real negotiating, you know, Orchard Street used to be like a big haggle space, you could go get a jacket and, you know, work on the price with the guy, but you can't do that anymore. So part of this process was not only about bringing back people um, and trying, but it was also about revitalizing a corridor, a neighborhood with a rich history of, of shopping and, 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 and so we hope that this process will also bear fruit to that. So now they're building, they're gonna start breaking ground by the summer, and um, they're going to be building on three sites. It's very real. And remember when we talked about earlier um, how people don't really know, and even everything we did, still people don't really know. So, and the, the thing about that is, social media shows you a lot. So there's, you know, I'm on social media. There's a page for the Lower East Side, and one of the local papers wrote about that they're going to be demolishing the Essex Street Market to start construction for Spur. And all of a sudden, it exploded. And people were like, I didn't know that was happening. This is happening, oh my gosh, what happened? We're losing our community, you know? And it just goes to show you that, you know, even with all of our efforts, you know, there were still so many people that we could not reach. And imagine the power that we could have built in a community if we had had more effective tools um, or had a, a broader reach, right? So that we could have really mobilized thousands of people, what that could have looked like. But in the absence of that, this is what we got. And for many, this was a victory. And it was a victory in and of itself only, even if Joel and Coles and us, if, even if we weren't completely happy with everything that we got, and we weren't, which is why we voted no, it was a victory because something is happening after 46 years. Right? That is a victory to people. They never thought. People called me all the time. I used to get emails all the time and they would say, I cannot believe this thing is real. That it's really moving forward. They thought it would never happen. So there's a victory in that. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering if the demands are varying, but when speaking with residents in Spura, I know a lot of them were very attached to the local retail, the local businesses that were there, that they worked there or own, or own themselves and whatnot. So is there, looking forward, plans to address to the city the need to really keep it local and keep the local residents employed in the future retail to come uh, to Essex Crossing. There are um, some local hiring provisions. Um, there, there are some local hiring provisions, and there's a local network that was created, which we actually are a part of, called the Lower East Side Employment Network. And <clears throat> so the jobs uh, from construction, um, uh, we're, we're supposed to get first crack at it 
I've been arguing that it's not a strong enough agreement, <clears throat> that we don't have anything in writing and that there's not a particular percentage of jobs. Uh, but I know that we've also started to work with the developers to hold public meetings and job fairs to attract, uh, you know, qualified applicants. And then, you know, the other issue that was really important to us is that they try to include something in the leases of these retail businesses so that there would be some kind of provision that would force, you know, anyone who came in in place um, on the developer as they begin to craft, you know, uh, the leases for all these retail spaces. I just want to add one other thing in terms of, I mean, there are many things in terms of uh, keeping developers accountable, but one of the other big projects of uh, Spark, which is the kind of coalition that Damaris talked about before, um, is to gather names of former site tenants. So while this kind of right to return was granted in the RFP, um, if you don't have the names of people, there's really no way to hold developers accountable. So that work of kind of just finding those people's names and contact information and getting that out there so that there's no way to say, oh, we didn't know, uh, is another really important piece of work in this kind of keeping people accountable. I mean, I think another thing too, we got the developer to put on their website a link so that you can go on and you can register and check that you were a former site tenant. But I think the challenge there is going to be the proof that people have to provide. And I, you know, I, I saw a, a post the other day on Facebook from someone because I put up, like, you know, I put a little bit about the history of Spur, and I was like, if you're a former site tenant, and you know, you have to bring documents. And somebody said, oh, okay, great. You know, now I'm going to have to go find my dead mother and ask her to give me rent receipts and all these things. And so that was like a real moment. It was a little morbid, but it was a real moment that. They may not be able to obtain some of these documents. They're going to have to get creative. Um, but we're pushing them to sort of you know, open up what they see as eligible to include other things that may be, may be, may be able to prove that people live there. So that's a really great place, actually, I think, to pause our discussion. Our, we have this incredible think tank here. Um, if you haven't been in the Panorama yet, one of the walls that we have occupied in the Panorama asks the question, what can we do? Right? In the face of top-down neighborhood planning that is not predisposed to include people from neighborhoods, what is it that we as the residents can do? And in the last two hours, I feel like we've gotten some fantastic recipes. I hope everybody is walking away with at least one action idea that you can take as inspiration from goals and the folks at Spura and apply to your own neighborhood as we all stay vigilant in New York to a continuing legacy of this kind of planning. Um, as you see from the map, this is neither history nor is it just one site. Spara is one site out of over 150, and over 60 of those are still active. Um, so thank you guys so much. Thank you, Marcy and Gabriel and Joel. You're all here at the perfect times. So lead us through, and I'm going to invite everyone.